you back. And I and Dan Lear and John hooked up that machine at Gordon's work. Leonard gave me a lesson like that one time. Leonard told me that David, the next time somebody says something nice to you, a night of, nice about you, simply say thank you, David. You say the nicest thing. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. Right, Leonard? Thank you, David. Thank you. No, I, I, and, I, and I just saw in the bulletin that we're broadcasting that in the afternoon so that our other members, so we, we miss our other members and, and we want to welcome each of you back who are here now and hope there are others who are watching, um, watch, watching our class from home or wherever they happen to be, so we miss, we miss them. So you all who were there in the, uh, uh, the early service a few minutes ago, here, here was John Ryan who came up to the podium and with his pad. And it reminds me that Van Leer brought this to my mind. Van Leer is the only one I've known who didn't need a, doesn't need a teleprompter. So John had that electronic device right there, and the way he began his sermon was, he says, boys, I sure hope it works. <laughs> that, that gave us a lot of confidence right there. Uh, just like Van, I didn't want to goose this to Van Leer, but when you, when you we had a role like I am introducing the speaker, often that person will have his notes right there on the pad. And Van Leer has trained us all in public speaking. You get you put your material right here, so you and you come to your class early, you've got the, the arrangement made. But so often that one who introduces the Van Leer will pick up the whole material as he sits down. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what I thought about John. And, and I, uh, John, I hope John's got his thoughts together because I knew, knew Van Leer would. Let's uh, think about our, the members of our class who are not with us or, or other members of our congregation or, or our spheres of influence of folks who may be in some type of distress or in, having a tough time or, or in, in, in so many ways. Who do we need to include in our prayers as we're trained to do? I think we need to keep George Ramsey in our Thank you. regular uh, prayers ongoing. I, I went last week, Sam Maloney trained me. Sam said, David, first thing you do when you come is Van Leer prepare. Sam would say, we want to get an update on Sam. Tammy can give that update. Uh, but go down to the office in the bulletin board and there'll be a prayer list there. I went last week and it's all gone, but maybe it's online now. So, but so uh, there, there's simply notes on that, uh, on that calendar now. But, would you give us a report on Sam, please? Well, so Sharon will have I, I saw Sam a couple of weeks ago walking in the corridor. Yeah. So I had I went by to see him last week, I guess on Wednesday, and um, he is very happy in assisted living. He says he is simplifying, <laughs> that he had too many socks, too many shirts, too many uh, too much of everything. He has a very simple life. His room is just he says he gets up in the morning, his army training, he gets up in the morning and makes his bed and doesn't get back in it until it's time to go to bed at night. And he's got his desk and his computer. And, um, and he said that he had, during COVID, it was such, and Pat, you've said this, the shutdown was so isolating and that um, he uh, decided to move to assisted living because he had more interaction. And then he likes the people who come in and, you know, and, and check on him. And he's just got a real social network there in assisted living. So he, they look very strong and healthy and great. And uh, gave me a great big bear hug. So nice. Sam, Sam uh, among many others, has left his mark on each of us. Mm -hmm. So whom else do we need to think about? Uh, Share anybody else in, in, within your orbit? Uh, well, we need. of course, Bob passed away, Bob Avenger, yes, this past week. Um, but, um, and Naira Brannon, some of you know Naira, some of you do not, but she is now under hospice. And so oh. she, please keep Naira in your prayers as well. Pat had an experience earlier this morning about how we serve each other and take care of these special needs. Will you share that with us, please, Pat? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I happened to get into a conversation with a couple of the ministers here, John Bryan and I think it was uh, uh, Robert Alexander, and I explained to them that my hearing was causing 
difficult problems. In this room, I'm okay. But in other places, I can hear, but I can't understand. And even in Lingle Chapel, it echoes for me. And I, and I just cannot understand. And I was explaining to them, and I said, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to come to church, because I need to be here. But I don't under, I didn't understand a word of the sermon today. <laughs> this morning, when I sat down in church, what happened? John Ryan came in and handed me this, a total copy of his sermon to read as I heard him speak. Now, what does that mean? Doesn't it mean that our church is serving every single member as well as they can? I was just silent. I can't understand. Me alone in all these people. It means a lot. So we hope, Pat, we hope the others will get that same message. Yes. So, so, only, so you won't get that script 25% of the time. We want you to have it 100% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that. Anybody else we need to think about now? Remember in a, in a prayer? Well, let me open us with a prayer of thanksgiving. A gracious, loving, giving, and eternal Heavenly Father, we bless you. In many ways, you made your presence felt in each of our lives. And just as you made your promise to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, the, the promise of land, the promise of seed, the promise of hope, the promise of opportunity, the promise of challenge, and the promise of reunion. You made that same promise to each of us today. We thank you for the reunion with our classmates. We play, pray for those members of our class and those various families of our congregation who are not with us today. We pray for your presence in, in each of those situations, those lives, just as you made your presence felt with each of us today. We pray for the President of the United States. We pray for each member of Congress. We pray for the members of the judiciary and all those in positions of responsibility and authority, authority over us. And just as we ask for your presence in our lives and your blessing and your plan for this world, we pray for that same blessing and gift to each of those. Pray that you'll be with us, guide us, fill us with your spirit, and uh, be with us as we go th through this day and uh, work as we work to enhance our own faith. Give us our many sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So here is, here is our speaker. Our noble and distinguished speaker, Van Thank Leer. You, <laughs> she got that message, didn't she? Who needs no teleprompter? There was John. I was so worried about John. If his, if his electronics failed, it's just embarrassing to say, "Boys, I don't have my script up here." Pat, may I have my script? <laughs> Van Leer needs none. And, and Van, Van Leer reminds me of President Clinton when he but his teleprompter operator went bad. You remember that? They put the wrong speech up. He was given the State of the Union speech. It's a long time ago. And his teleprompter operator put the wrong speech up there, to which President Clinton just carried on for an hour and 15 minutes. Well, that's Van Leer. Van Leer doesn't need a, a teleprompter. I could remove these notes right here, and she would go on with great exuberance for each of us. So, Van Leer, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you for being our teacher. We thank you for your preparation. And, and we're ready for it. Thank you, David. <laughs> of course, I was just thinking this morning, I did this lesson Wednesday, and I hope I can remember what I did. Good morning. Good morning. Wait a minute, now I've got to put this thing on. Well, what happened to the... There was a little... No, no little clip. Huh? There's no little clip. There was a little clip. Oh, that's because I... I did this wrong. We'll, we'll call that the John Ryan moment. <laughs> yeah, you yes. were yourself the clip. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't like technology. I'm a Luddite, I think. Oh, well, I'll just hold it. Hi. Hello, good morning. Um, uh, we are still in Matthew, 
I hope you noticed that John preached on the same lesson yes. that we had last week, except yes. he took it from Mark instead of from Matthew. And he got that from you. You did such a great job. Well, he, no, he, he watched the rerun. I told him, I said, this was the lesson last week yes. in the Maloney class, and he said, oh, darn, I should have been there. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, he watched you online. The no, he, he missed it. Of course. <laughs> um, the lesson today is from, Matthew, from the 14th chapter of Matthew and um, it is, an, again, we are, at the, we are on the Sea of Galilee. Remember, all through the Bible, the sea is both a promise and a peril, a promise and a threat. Um, the sea can be tranquil, or the sea can be tumultuous, just the way our lives can be tranquil or tumultuous. And this is... Um, this is after he's. This is um, another C episode. And while you while I look at this, remember again that Matthew is writing his gospel sometime between 70 B.C. No, not B.C. C.E. I have the worst time with C.E. for some reason. Christian era. That's the new. Between 70 C C.E. and uh, about 170 CE, about a hundred year. There's about a hundred year period when he was, in which he might, any time of which he could have been writing this, this, this gospel. We we are sure that he wrote it after the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. He is writing to Jews, but he is writing to Jewish Christians. Mo almost who almost certainly are living outside of Palestine by now, and who are. Um, probably living in, in major cities. They're, Jews tended to congregate in, in the major cities of the empire. Um, one lesson, I, one source I read speculated that perhaps possibly Antioch would have been a, a place that he could have been living and writing to. He's writing in good Greek. By this time, most Jews, no, no, the Jews, Greek is the lingua franca of the, of the, of the Roman Empire. Um, not Latin, Greek. Educated people spoke Greek. And most Jews are Greek speaking at this point to the, to, the, to the point where in Alexandria they commissioned a Greek Old Testament, translation of the Old Testament, because nobody could speak Hebrew anymore, could read Hebrew anymore. So Matthew is writing in Greek to Jewish Christians. And he is writing at a time of peril. At, he's writing about times of peril. Oh, here. He's writing about times of peril. He's writing about um, Palestine under the Roman occupation when life was perilous. Um, people were taxed to death. I mean, literally, taxation was, was a huge burden. Uh, most people were living hand-to-mouth existences. Not everybody, but most, particularly people out in the countryside. And you never knew when a Roman legion or Roman army members, or worse, thugs from Herod were going to come and rob you blind. It was a very precarious time. Well, now he's writing about precarious times, the times when Jesus taught, but he's writing to people who are also living in precarious times. At the, by the time he's writing, uh, probably the persecutions against Jews, were, I mean, against Christians, were beginning. And um, the, the Christian church was, was being, and, but not only is it Romans who are persecuting Christians, it's also other Jews. Jewish Christians tended, did, they did not see themselves as having left the Jewish religion. They saw the teachings of Christ as being a fulfillment and amplification of the Old Testament. And, but Jews who were orthodox, who were more um, traditional in their beliefs, really resented this and probably were probably were concerned about it. I mean, they, they probably thought it might take over the religion. Um, so before there's this split, um, there's real you know, dissension in the Jewish communities over those who follow the teachings of Christ and those who do not. Eventually, of course, the Gentile converts are going to greatly outnumber the Jewish converts and the Gentiles, it will become a Gentile religion, essentially. But it's a time of uncertainty, a time of peril, a time of 
just difficulty. It actually kind of reminds me of the time that we're living in right now. Uncertainty and peril and difficulty and real concern about, about things. So that when he is writing this story, this, this, when he is writing this account of Jesus in, the, in another account of Jesus on a boat, um, think of his audience. Think of what this account meant to people who were living in great peril. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. This is, after again, after the feeding of the 5,000. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. Now, this is one of the miracles of nature. We talked about there are four kinds of miracles. The miracles of exorcism or casting out spirits, the miracles of healing, the miracles of raising the dead, and the miracles of nature. And again, uh, if you're a rational person and you try to analyze this, I, you could say he was wading through the shallows. Um, or you can take it on faith and say he was walking on the sea. Um, I, 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 you have to make your own decision, I think, about how you, how you accept these miracles of Jesus. But here he comes, the, 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 the disciples are being tossed in this boat, and here comes Jesus suddenly walking towards them across the water. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them over the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, in Matthew, there are, count them, seven times that Jesus says, do not be afraid. I can give you the citations if you want. <laughs> um, I'll spare you. Seven times he says, do not be afraid. He does not want us to fear. The heart of that message, though, is it is I. I am here. It is I. Remember what Jesus is preaching. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. I am here. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now this story is told, the story of Jesus walking on water is told in at least two other Gospels. The other two accounts don't mention Peter. The Peter story is unique to, to Matthew. But the Peter story is very important because Peter, Peter is, the, is really the the primary disciple. Um, now, you might get another impression if you read the Gospel of John, where it constantly refers to John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But Peter is, Peter is the first disciple called. And he is the rock. That's right. And he is the rock. He, his name was Simon, and Jesus renames him. Petrus, the Greek word for rock. Your, your name is Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Why Peter? Look at Peter. Peter is kind of every man, isn't he? 
Faith and lack of faith. Faith and lack of faith. Exactly. Exactly. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Peter will, will do... I'm, he will draw a sword in the garden and cut off the ear of the of the people who come to of the, one of the men who have come to arrest Jesus. But he also will go to sleep when Jesus needs him, when they're alone in the garden and, and Jesus is praying. And Peter goes to sleep. He will deny Jesus three times. First, he, he will bravely accompany Jesus to the home of the high priest, and then he'll deny him three times because he's afraid. Peter is a very human person. And yet it's Peter that Jesus selects to be the rock on which he, the foundation of the church. The, um, the papacy, the, the, in, in Catholicism, the Pope is considered to be a, a direct descendant of, of, of Peter. Peter is the first Pope. Um, the Pope walks in the shoes of the fishermen. And what is the name of the basilica in, Ro in, in the Vatican City? St. Peter's. Peter's. <clears throat> he is you and me. How often have you said to yourself, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief? And how often have you thought, I'm not worthy, I can't do this? Well, if Peter could do it, we can do it. That's the message. <laughs> And Peter will be, how did Peter, what happened to Peter in the end? Do you, do you remember? <coughs> What's the tradition? Crucified upside down. Crucified upside down. He said he was not, he, he, he went to Rome. <coughs> he took the gospel even unto Rome. And he said that he was, that he was arrested and he was to be crucified. Uh, assume, I assume he was arrested for sedition because Rome only used crucifixion in cases of, of sedition. Um, and he said, I am not worthy to die the way my Lord died. So they crucified him upside down. He was crucified upside down. That's the tradition. Um, so here's Peter who says, Lord, it is it's you. Command me to walk on the water. Faith. And, then, and he's walking. He's actually, he's doing it. And then suddenly he begins to get frightened and he begins to sink. And how often have we been in that situation? Lots. Lots. <laughs> yeah. And during the pandemic, during the pandemic, how often did you think maybe you were going to sink? Lots. Lots. This has been a hard time. We've talked about the loneliness. We've talked about, I, you know, I, I'm not a person who usually experiences depression, but I've had moments of, of depression. I live alone. Um, I, well, I did. I now have Fauci and Queen Charlotte. Um, cats. Uh, um, thanks to my next door neighbors who didn't think I should be alone. Um, we've all been through, we've been, we have felt isolated. We have felt... You know, we've sunk. We've been. We have sunk a little bit. And yet, then Christ reaches out his hand, or he says, um, Peter calls out. Though, even though he's sinking because he's frightened, he calls out, "Lord, save me!" So again, the faith, the faith that God, the Lord, that Jesus can save him. Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately, immediately reached out his hand. He didn't even let him, you know, gasp a little bit. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why do we doubt? Why do we doubt? You have a need. You have a need. You call out if you have a need. Well, and, and have you ever noticed that you call out more when you have a need than you do when you don't have a need? <laughs> I'm a big prayer when I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's too bad that faith isn't something concrete like a brick. Um, it's a lot easier to believe. Um, and I think when you get in trouble, sometimes you get it out whether your faith is sufficient. Or even to have, you even. Or even help. Even help, yeah. yeah. I mean, we are only human. 
they do. We are frail vessels, and Peter is, and Peter is a perfect example of that. He was only human. And sometimes he had faith, and sometimes he didn't, and sometimes he was very frightened and just worried about his own skin. And sometimes he was very selfish and just went to sleep when he was tired instead of being by his, his master. He was only human. But he is the one whom Jesus made the foundation of the church. Only human. A human. Which means that we are all the foundations of the church because all Jesus has is us of little faith. So, O oh ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, contrast that with the end of the, of the miracle where Jesus um, uh, calms the sea. When the, the boat is about to sink and the, the, the disciples are terrified and they call out to him and he, he calms the sea. What do the disciples say then? What did they say then? No, they say something different. But if the wind and sea obey you, then he must be the son of God. Don't they say, who is this man? That the wind and sea obey That the wind, yeah. the wind and sea obey him. <laughs> who is this man? Power. <laughs> uh, who is this man? But uh, by, the, by, the, by this, just a few, ch a few chapters, chapters later, Matthew has the disciples saying, surely you are the son of God. Not who are you? You are the Son of God. An expression of faith. Um, so how do you, so what he is saying, what Matthew is saying in this, in this story is, is an assurance to the young Christian community that even though Jesus cannot be seen, he is still present. And that their faith, their, they, they should place their faith in him. Do not be afraid, for he is with you. He is always with you. And we need that message today as much as the early Christians needed it in Antioch and Corinth and all through the Roman Empire. Do not be afraid. I am here. What's your reaction to this? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, Matthew bookends the gospel with Emmanuel in the birth narrative. You know, I'm with you. God is with God you. God is with you. That's true. And then in 28, one of the last things that we're told that Matthew wants us to take away is, I'm with you always until the end of the age. So if you didn't get it up front, and if you didn't get it in the middle, hopefully you'll get it at the end. He says it twice in 28. Do not be afraid, I'm with you. Yeah, right. um, yeah and, and here in the middle, he slaps it to you again. One more, <laughs> One more time. I am with you. It's a message for us today as surely as it was to the Jewish Christians of the Roman Empire. And it's a message that we need to hear. And certainly, I mean, after this, this year and a half that we've come through, um, our boat has rocked pretty, pretty severely. Do you have any rea any other reactions to this? I had a geopolitical fault <laughs> when you you began with the the uh, Jewish communities around the yep. basin. If you read it all, but I don't remember when it occurred. But the uh, reading about the Levant. The, the, the disparate of those Jewish communities, and perhaps, I don't remember when it occurred. After 70 AD was when it, they had begun leaving Palestine earlier. I mean, there were Jewish communities before the destruction, before yeah. the, that rebellion and the destruction of the yeah. temple. But after the destruction of Jerusalem, I mean, they poured out. That's when the real dis dispersion, diaspora began. But all around the, the basin, the whole Mediterranean basin. Yeah, and eventually they'll get as far as China and India and uh, Western Europe. Uh, yeah. And Eastern Europe and then into the West. 
Yes. Um, <clears throat> this is just kind of a little aside. Uh, speaking of, uh, I'm like you in that my normal personality is not to be depressed. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable feeling to feel depressed. Yes. During yes. the pandemic because you know, we were not to interact and all you could call on the phone and that kind of thing. But the one good thing that I took away from this uh, upon a lot of reflection was I came to try to relate to those who are incarcerated, to those who um, live in total isolation for whatever reason and just try to embrace, you know, how is it for them? And the importance for trying to somehow reach people, whether it's through prison ministry, yes. through, uh, you know, just isolation within communities, or it, it's, it's, it's an overwhelming feeling. Isolation, and actually, in my opinion, solitary confinement should be cruel or unusual punishment. Um, and I'll tell you a story, just to, to digress, but in line with what you say. Uh, I, as you know, as most of you know, I worked for years in a, in a secure, locked residential treatment facility for adolescents. And we used to get, most, most of the young people who came there were court ordered for treatment. And Okay, and frequently, we would get kids who came from more rural counties. They had been arrested, and for their own safety, they had been put in solitary because they didn't have a separate juvenile detention facility. So in the prison, in the, in the local jail, they were in solitary for their own safety, which unfortunately was necessary. What, how did those kids come to us? They were usually psychotic. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They were usually psychotic by the time they came. Okay. So first we had to deal with that before we could deal with the reason they were there in the first place. Yeah. Solid, isolation can do that to people. Yeah. Very inhuman. Mm -hmm. um, isolation can, is really a soul destroying thing. But again, we are, we are a, we were talking about this before the class. We are a herd people. I mean, we are people who, who really thrive on the companionship of others. And I've just spent a year and a half, I was telling somebody my only dinner companion was Anderson Cooper. I feel very close to him. <laughs> um, I'm very close, actually. Maybe I should write him and tell him. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, so, you know, so here is Peter sinking. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Um, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Do you remember that old hymn? But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now save them I. Um, here's Peter sinking for lack of faith, but at the same time he calls out, Lord, help, help me, and the Lord, and the Lord saves him. Don't be afraid, I am here. It's our message for the day. Any other reactions to that? Well, for a hymn, I'm oh good, I thought I'd lost this. John's going to kill me for this. <laughs> um, for our hymn, I want to read, this is, I think, my favorite hymn. And um, I want, it's, you will all know it, it is a good Presbyterian hymn, but it's How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in God's excellent word. What more can he say than to you God has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. Fear not, I am here. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be near thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. 
The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Do you ever feel after you've been through a fiery trial that you might be a better person? That you, that certain experiences Somehow, growth experiences seem to be always the painful ones. We learn more from trial than we do from trivial pleasures. Yeah, we have to come to grips with ourselves. Yes, we learn more about ourselves and we learn how to cope. Mm -hmm. And in social work, coping is a big, that's a, that's a big deal. Well, any other reactions to this? Any? I think you've reminded me that when we read the Gospels, we have to read them through the lens of the resurrection and, and realize that everything that we're going to be reading in them has been tempered by the fact that Christ is risen. And, and, and that lens cannot be removed, should not be removed. That they, the Gospels don't make sense apart from the resurrection. No. And that's why you don't have any. Pro I don't have any problem with the miracles because if you could come back from the dead, you can do anything. Yeah. Um, that's exactly right. And every gospel writer knows is aware. I, we are we are writing to you because, uh, because there is a living God. Right. And we are writing of things that happened in the past, but they are still happening because we have a living God. That's exactly right. Who is with us? Right. Let's bow our heads and say a prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together again, to be with people, to see people, to talk with people, to have people see us. Thank you that you have been with us through the trials and the tempestuous sea that we have come through. We were never truly alone because you were there. You are always there, and thank you, Lord. Dear Lord, be with us as we move into the coming week. Help us to remember that we are your instruments. We are how your work gets done on this earth. And make us worthy and give us strength. Dear Heavenly Father, we make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.